everybody. Um, thank you for joining us today on Patrick's Day. Uh, we're delighted to have you with us and we're delighted to have as our guest, Mark Ivan Gorman. Mark Ivan is an artist, an Irish artist based in Los Angeles. He describes himself as a story maker, working across stage, screen, radio, print and immersive media. So he's very interested in history, art and culture and he's worked in um, many different forms in order to engage with these. He also is involved in um, writing for Hollywood and has run uh, Irish film theatre or Irish film festivals in India. So um, uh, thank you for joining us today, Mark Ivan. Thanks very much for having me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, happy St. Patrick's Day. Same to you all. Um, so in your adaptations, uh, in your radio programs, your own work, you cross um, art forms, media and genres. So can you tell us what about that is interesting to you and tell us about these um, projects that you've been involved in? Okay, well, I mean, I, I think, um, I, mean, I would suspect that many artists would like the opportunity and the space to kind of change medium, change genre, change kind of art form. Um, I've, I've had the luxury of doing so, so I've done that. Now, I, I mean, I think, you know, the, why this is perhaps not done more, uh, I think there's various reasons. I mean, I think they're both internal, where uh, people feel they have, uh, you know, mastered a particular discipline. And then when they move into something new, their reputation is at stake if you have established, uh, you know, an ability in one area. And uh, so there's an internal thing. I think there's an external thing as well, which is all of the sort of um, structural uh, forces in society like people to specialize because that's how we can identify them. You know, that person, you know, when you know someone by their job, that person's a sculptor, that person's an illustrator, that person is a doctor and so forth. And so I think both internally, people's kind of conception of themselves and then externally trying to get funding maybe, trying to get a gallery, trying to get people in, engaged in your work. They have um, kind of views of who you are and what you do. And so, uh, I mean, I've certainly, I've definitely benefited because I feel I have the, psychologically I have the freedom to jump into loads of different spaces, but it certainly um, it certainly is a disadvantage in terms of a career path, to be frank. You know, because people want to know, you know, what's your brand? What do you do specifically? And if every time they speak to you or see you, you know, a year later, you're doing a different, you're in a different field. They're like, it's very, um, it's very unsettling. You know, so. I mean, I, I think it's kind of a natural in, in, innate um, instinct in people, but I just think there's loads of forces that restrict it happening more. Mm. I mean, it, do you think that there's something um, particularly Irish about this ability to negotiate different fields and different genres and different media? So, you know, our kind of great, uh, Artists are often thought of as um, producers of literature, but within those fields, they often mix together different forms and genres. And there's a real questioning of um, conventional structures. So do you think that this working across different media opens up possibilities now um, that in some ways kind of reinterpret or revisit the kinds of questioning of form that people like James Joyce or um, Flann O'Brien undertook, you know, these are figures that you've represented in, in different ways that we'll, we'll get onto in a minute. Okay, well, I think there's two things there. I think there's a, there is the flexibil flexibility within a form, the conventions of the form. And that if you say, I'm going to write a novel, um, you know, we understand what a novel should be in terms of characters and uh, a story and all the rest of it. So James Joyce, there's an example there, who takes the form and then he is extraordinarily, you know, flexible with it. I think there's a slightly different idea if James Joyce then said, 
I am going to be a choreographer. Um, and I, I don't know. So, so that has to do with, you know, what I was speaking about beforehand. Maybe he could have been a great choreographer. Now, I, I think we can talk about Joyce uh, a little bit more in terms of jumping between art forms. But I think there is an Irish quality to expanding. Um, I think there's an Irish quality to expanding within uh, the form. And my pet theory about that is uh, the idea is a kind of post-colonial. I think there's two things in, in why we expand the form. I think there's a post-colonial thing. You know, um, Joyce spoke about, you know, the difficulty of expressing the experience of the oppressed using the language of the oppressor. And I think there's a big component of that in how Irish writers uh, certainly have embraced English, writing in English, which is how, you know, we can, I can take this uh, and manipulate it make it my own, to express my own identity, which is outside the, the center, you know? Uh, and I think there's also another aspect in terms of storytelling is that I think we have a style of storytelling that is maybe, it's quite uh, uniquely Irish uh, in terms of it is uh, maybe a little bit like how I speak, which is rambling and uh, digresses and, is not necessarily have a clear beginning, middle and end in a quite conventional way. I think that does, um, you know, display a kind of a, a, a kind of Irish thought process, you know, and I think, you know, people like, uh, you know, in translations in the Brian Friel play, he, he kind of taps into this idea, certainly in comparison to sort of Britishness, you know, and the idea that the you know, the English guy asks the Irish guy for directions and the response is, well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't start here if I were you. And, you know, that, that looks from the outside like, uh, you know, what's the Irish bulls, this notion of Irish people are kind of bizarre that they have this really perverse way of looking at the world. But it's only perverse if you're not Irish. If you're looking from an outside, it, look, it doesn't make sense. But you're going, well, it may you know, uh, have a, a revelation into a, a, a kind of Irish psyche that is perhaps maybe more nuanced, sophisticated, uh, takes in a lot of contradictions, absurdities, mm, you know, yeah. etc. So, in, in so in terms of flexibility with form, um, and if we talk about James Joyce and Fan O'Brien later, that is, I think, the two parts of it. One is the post-colonial thing, that going, this is not our language, so we don't have to be so precious with it. And secondly, we actually have a style of storytelling, which I would say is, has a tradition that isn't that conventional model. Yeah. I mean, maybe we can get on to talking about Flan O'Brien, I think, because He's a, you know, a very interesting example of someone who worked across multiple different media. He's best known for his novels. He wrote a, a strange comic column for the Irish Times. He wrote um, radio plays, stage plays, and also television scripts, some of which were filmed. And uh, some people say that he um, wasted most of his energy in the newspaper column. But there is a sense of this kind of scattering across genres possibly undermine the kind of force of his work altogether. However, I think we're at a moment now in kind of reevaluating what modernism is, what literature is, uh, and which we can now reconsider his corpus and think about the kind of movement between these different forms. And so you um, produced and uh, made um, a radio program about Flann O'Brien, Brian O'Nolan, Miles McGopoly, which was a kind of markedly polyphonic enterprise. Um, and this is, I think, a really interesting counterpoint to your other work. So do you want to tell us a bit about that um, radio program for that aired on Lyric FM, I believe? Okay, well, um, so in the Flann O'Brien, I mean, I think, you know, the Flann O'Brien situation is kind of interesting, or Brian and Nolan. I think there are, again, there are external factors in saying why his work was the way it was. And if we compare it to James Joyce, for example. So, you know, I think there's a personality differences there in terms of attitude to their own work, which would factor how they approach it. I feel 
James Joyce had a remarkable sense of self. Uh, this, in terms of, as an artist, I, I think he's extraordinarily confident in what he's doing. And when everyone in the world was saying, what are, what are you doing? He was quite happy to say, I'm redefining uh, literature. And when people would say, you know, and he did Ulysses and people were like, half people, I don't know what that is. And other people going, oh, that's really interesting. And he said, I told you so, it's a work of staggering genius. And what's more, I'm going to write another book, which is going to be even more obscure. And guess what? That's even better. And if you don't get it, that's your problem. Because I am the benchmark the standard by which all literature will be judged. Now, that's an extraordinary position to put yourself in as an artist. Now, very rare. I think Brian and Olin is more, it's a lot more um, common mentality in that he talks about Joyce a lot because he's in the shadow of Joyce, as most Irish writers were afterwards. And he's kind of obsessed and terrified and dismissive and he goes through all different things, but he's just, he can't get out of the shadow. And then he does his book, uh, Swim Two Birds. It's, you know, among the literati, it's um, embraced. So Graham Greene loves it, you know, uh, and um, uh, it's generally considered, you know, one of the sort of postmodern masterpieces before the war, all that. Then he does his other book, Third Policeman, and it gets rejected. And he, go, he just goes into a spiral after that. So uh, I think a spiral in terms of writing novels, he doesn't write another novel that doesn't get released posthumously. So I think James Joyce would have taken that rejection and go, the fools, um, I'm gonna keep doing this till someone figures out how great it is. And I think Flann O'Brien had to make a living and he worked as, um, as a civil servant and he wrote, wrote for the newspaper. And I think you can, you can say um, this is a, you know, this is him kind of running away from his craft, but he also, I understand he had to make a living and he also wanted his stuff to get out there and be appreciated. So I guess, so, I mean, aside from the artistic ambition, I think that's just the reality of what artists have to face, which is how do, how do I continue to work and make my living? I mean, I think here in America, we look at, you know, Eugene O'Neill famously um, was uh, kind of disappointed about his father taking whole career playing the same part over and over again, but his dad had to make a living to feed his family and all that. So, so that's in terms of the actual realistic practical concern of arts. In terms of, uh, and then in terms of what Flannel Bryan did in terms of, of, of writing the newspaper, I guess maybe we can talk about, about that again, in terms of how that relates to, um, you know, contemporary hypertext uh, work and the internet and all that. But since your question was about what I did, <laughs> I can, um, I came across Flannel Bryan, I first worked on an Abbey production of At Some Two Birds many years ago, I did the film, there was a film component of it. And I was always interested in Flann O'Brien. And then I came across the uh, piece of information that he actually wrote for the Carlo Nationalist, which is my hometown. And I, my view of my hometown as the same as my view of being Irish is I find an extremely useful window in which to look at the rest of the world, that, that, that Blake idea of seeing the world in a grain of sand. I find it quite interesting how this helps you kind of look at many ideas. And so once I, I, I discovered that he, he wrote there under a, an avatar called George Noel, I, um, I decided I would try and, and, and make a radio piece that would be a, a kind of biopic as were the audio version of a, bi a biographical story in the manner of a Miles McLaughlin or Flann O'Brien story. And so his work, surrealist, um, you know, uh, sort of uses metafiction, uh, it's kind of characters undermine the writer, 
and I also felt there was a kind of um, a sense of humor that kind of was akin to I, I associated with like Spike Milligan, also Irish person, and 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 the Goon Show, and that kind of there seemed to be a post-war absurdism that was going on. So I thought uh, the, the story then is is a, a mixture of documentary and drama, and the drama is all of um, uh, Brian and Nolan's different writing avatars meet each other, and they're kind of they meet and they fight and they argue and we see different sides. Uh, we see different sides of the um, of the writer and it's hopefully told in the tone of a Flann O'Brien story and that was um, that was the hope. Yeah, it, it certainly is. I mean, it's a it's a very lively listen and it's a really interesting. Um, use of radio because of the kind of illusionistic capacities of radio you can um with a few sound effects give the impression of you know cast of thousands um the same person can play multiple different characters uh, there's a kind of um, dramatic potential there and there's a, a liveliness i think um to the editing that is um that's that's really interesting uh, it, i think it's something that um Brian O'Nolan would um, approve of if he were capable of approving of anything, um, if he heard today. So I wonder if, you know, with these capacities of radio and contemporary editing, um, how you think about, you know, um, Brian O'Nolan, how he would uh, give expression to himself now. So in the Krushkin Non column, he does a, a lot of, you know, quotation and play on existing. Um, printed matter, you know, reusing cliches, pointing to editorials, making fun of them, you know, sampling in different ways. And uh, how do you think that that kind of um, kind of piratical and um, very sort of irreverential attitude to surrounding culture um, might inspire something now or, you know, given given the technology we have? Well, I think where the Brian O'Nolan um, sort of style is evident in kind of contemporary life is, is the fact that online we can be whoever we want to be. And I think that's his real um, sort of the, ge the genius, and this is why I went with the different kind of uh, avatars, is that the genius of writing an article in a newspaper and then writing under a nom de plume in the letters page, criticizing your own writing. And then the next article, supposedly written by you, but perhaps by one of your friends, and then writing in another newspaper, commenting on the letter. This idea of multiple, this, so this is where the metafiction bit comes into it. This is where uh, having um, multiple characters, multiple personas in different um, platforms is a very contemporary idea. And so I, I have seen, um, I have seen some work done in this area uh, where writers have created online avatars and they just write for comedy's sake and go, going, oh, this is a character and I'm going to keep writing and then people then kind of cite them in as serious characters in newspaper articles and then they're you know that's their that's their dream scenario is that suddenly my fiction it, it's so close to satirizing the contemporary life that it's now acknowledged as a as a, as a real thing so I think that's it in audio audio is slightly different I don't know that there's Currently, there's not as much interaction. I know there's a new platform um, called Clubhouse, which is a kind of interactive audio thing. But generally, where audio is at, which has taken a revival, is in podcasts. So, you know, I, um, growing up in Ireland, the radio is always on. Uh, I came to America and I was taken by public radio and the quality of public radio was just mad a lot. And then, uh, I thought, oh, this is, it seems kind of old fashioned thing to be turned on the wireless and listening to voices, but podcasts have now made it ubiquitous. And in fact, where screens require us to be planted in a position, 
um, you know, the podcast can have us do all the other things that we have to do in our lives and still be going yeah. through. So, yeah. so I don't know if the, I don't know if Brian and Nolan would be in, in audio per se, but I definitely think he would be on Twitter and I think he'd be have multiple uh, sock puppets, as they should say, of different little um, avatars yeah. that would be yeah. interacting with each other. I mean, I think that, you know, the potential of these new forms is really interesting in countering maybe the cult of celebrity, which has been around for a long time, and which you could say that Joyce nurtured around himself, but that, you know, this um, possibility of having different voices, of um, splicing together different um, voices from different sources online in podcasts um, uh, is, I think, a very interesting way of um, offering a kind of... Uh, impersonal or um, alternative approach to the artistic persona. So someone who is mobilizing different elements, but not center stage themselves. And I think this is why I'm particularly interested in your work because of this kind of, there's the absence of the kind of crafted celebrity or the person who is specializing in one thing who has a brand identity and instead a kind of exploration that in some ways feels very familiar to me, I think, from, from working on Brian and Nolan. So, you know, you can say Brian and Nolan was trying to make ends meet and he had to take whatever he get, but actually he had a really solid income as a civil servant and he was choosing to go into these different media. And I wonder, um, and in a kind of um, anti-monumentalizing way. Um, and I think that this is a particularly important and interesting approach given the sort of, um, Hyper presence of personalities in our popular culture now, um, the cultivation of everyone as a kind of personal presence to the public. I, I, I absolutely agree, and I would uh, I would go uh, as far as to say, the book form, in fact, is a object version of that brand, because. I, I, I think it's kind of interesting. Now you have the standard Zoom background of a big bookshelf with all books in it. <laughs> they're real. And, <laughs> no, they're real. It's not okay. But but this notion to me, I think, is very interesting. Is that there is definitely a, an elevating of the book form as a superior form of literature, and why? I mean, it just seems such a, a conventional way, and and so. You know, I did talk about why, you know, the comparison between Flan and Brian and Joyce in terms of their, you know, sense of self. But who's to say that he's, the, his real art form is not Pushkin Lawn and the column? And that, mm -hmm. but, you, but you can say that because then, as I said about people, how people define artists is going, if you spoke to someone who never knew of Flan and Brian, you can't say, oh, he wrote a column in an Irish newspaper. You know, that doesn't get you on a stamp that doesn't get your, you know, uh, so I think, I well, think is form why, is very, yeah. Mm. Yeah, well, you know, this is why I asked the question because in modernist studies over the last 10 or more years, scholars have really turned to other media like, like radio, like newspapers, forms that are considered marginal and secondary before mm. and have, are trying, they're trying to come up with vocabularies to speak about them and conceptualize them as important contributions. I think you're completely right about the dominance of the book. You know, it's the, the easiest form. It's the, it's the most readily at hand. Um, it's the most collectible. It's a kind of tangible object. But it's also prestige, it's, let's be honest. I mean, the thing is, there's a, you know, there's a certain uh, education, social position, intellectual kind of position of going, I have a bunch of books and you know, and here they are, and I've read them, and I know about them. Where everybody can just pick up a newspaper every day. So there's a class thing. There's a there's loads of things in there. But you know, like people don't talk about Dickens wrote for the newspaper. I mean, he wrote. That's where all the books came from. He wrote in the newspaper every week, and that's why Dickens has cliffhangers every chapter because the famous novelist Dickens wrote yeah. in the newspaper every day. So. I think it has as much to do with what we, how we compartmentalize in the taxonomy of artists and their work about, you know, what we value in those contexts. So 
I, yeah, I, I, I think probably um, uh, Brendan Knowles' real genius is his, is, his, is his newspaper column and how he approached it, um, since he only has really two or three novels yeah. in any case. Yeah, no, I totally agree with you. Um, so will you, will you tell us more about your, your work, um, so your own work? I, I'm very interested in uh, your adaptation of Finnegan's Wake for stage. But also yeah. original, like original pieces that you've made. Um, you know, you're writing for Hollywood, and you know early pieces like Icon, um, that are you know visual media. So can you tell us more about your own artistic production? Yeah. Okay. Well, like uh, like I said, I mean, I like to I like to jump around uh, forms because um, I. Uh, it's hard, you know, with the branding thing going, you know, what writing my artist um, statement is often difficult for me because I, I find it's on a case by case basis. I'm interested in this subject. I picked this form because I thought this was the best way to say this thing. Um, but in terms of, I think my, uh, you know, overriding interest is, is, is definitely um, a sense of a, a requirement towards populism, that I like the idea of feeling I, I'm trying to make things accessible. And so um, let me say, so Icon is a short film that I made many years ago. And um, the, the, the kind of, the, the commission was, well, it was a, a competition. Uh, it was an MTV Europe competition to make a short film that kind of, identified the idea of uh, a European identity of some description. Um, and so what I chose, and this is a long time ago, this is uh, 1997, I chose uh, to pick uh, Renaissance paintings from across Europe, French, German, Dutch, uh, well, religious iconography actually, and contemporize them in terms of the settings and also make them kind of a tableau vivant. Um, and so what I was trying to do in this quite short film, it's only a minute long, was connect the cultures of Europe in terms of they're all dealing with this common uh, imagery and then contemporize them by putting the settings in a contemporary settings as the painters who did it at the time would have when you see Nason's painting, Jesus is in Tuscany and there's like it's contemporary things happening. And then also I kind of tap on a kind of a couple of uh, contemporary social issues that I think spoke to the initial teachings in sort of New Testament ideas. So it was religious iconography, contemporary settings, and then contemporary kind of social issues. Um, and so for me then the kind of goal there is the idea to connect the, and this was on MTV, so it's a very popular uh, kind of context, but for me it was for the public to kind of go, oh, I recognize those. They may recognize one image, but then it was on repeated viewing. So people would see it a lot. And then over time, they'd probably be able to identify um, other, um, other paintings. And uh, so the music I used also was, a, was an Irish medieval tune. And I have a, put in a bit of a, in the Book of Kells in there in, 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 in the film as well. Um, can you show it to us? Okay, uh, let me uh, see, can I hear? Um, you can tell me if, okay. Um, so is everybody seeing this? Yeah. <laughs> I think you get the idea. I think it's just the idea. Yeah. I mean, these are what look like ordinary people, 
who move into a configuration that is very similar to a famous painting. And so I think there's something really um, democratic about this gesture. Um, you know, it's very um, egalitarian and it does um, return to, you know, some of the kind of philosophy of the New Testament about, you know, the importance of each person and maybe the ideals of the European Union about, you know, this sort of fundamentally democratic um, association of countries. It's, you know, it's really nice to see that kind of enthusiasm, that kind of optimism about a European future um, expressed in this beautiful way. Well, I mean, that was that was certainly uh, my view then, and it's my view still regarding, um, you know, Europe and Ireland's place in Europe. And I think um, I kind of, again, from a historical point of view, um, I feel we, uh, we were the little brother to the British and, 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 and there has been certain benefits in terms of our interaction with the rest of the world in that context. Uh, but I did feel that you know our role in Europe meant that we could define that again we had an opportunity of just not in relation not the kind of uh the inscrutable Irish person from a British perspective but that we could define that so mm -hmm. I definitely that was that is definitely my position but you know uh, in terms of the idea of it being democratic and the rest of it just again going back to where my instinct lies from a kind of a from a personal psychological point of view you know I, I grew up uh, in rural Ireland I, I didn't go to private school I went to the local Christian brothers and you know I played on the Gaelic football team and I played in the rugby team and uh, I grew up with a certain understanding of a kind of machismo uh, that young boys what they should do and what they should be interested in and I kind of persisted with what I wanted to do anyway. And I think I felt the urge and I've kind of felt it ever since is that I don't want to keep, even, even though my interests are rather avant-garde and often obscure, I don't think they are um, uh, elitist. I, this is my view is going, these were things I was interested in as a kid and I'm not a weirdo, they're actually fun. You just have to look, look at them, yeah. you know? Yeah. And so, uh, that is that absolutely is my instinct in everything I do and I think in this it was the idea of taking pieces of work that would be in a museum again a place for the select and putting it on a popular form like tv and then the actual content was everyday people so in fact the end shot with the virgin uh, and child is in my old doll office which gave me great satisfaction to go back to my dole office and shoot a thing for MTV in there. You know? I bet, I bet. So I want to connect this to James Joyce actually and Finnegan's work. Mm. So this, uh, you know, it's very easy to see, to be intimidated by Joyce's works. Um, mm. And say, especially Finnegan's Wake, you'll see this is bad enough, Finnegan's Wake seems worse. Mm. However, um, Joyce wrote the book with the idea that everyone's voices were included in it. And he would, you know, in talking with people and rest of a conversation that's recorded where he said that waitress, the woman over there, everyone is writing this book. So he felt that the book was weaving together the voices of many people in representing an Irish family, but in some ways exploded or containing all of the world. So this idea of a kind of Ireland, like uh, of representing Europe, is actually very important and in resisting national boundaries. And Joyce published Finnegan's Wake in 1939. So he was really worried about the Second War, Second World War distracting people from his book. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sounds pretty bad in retrospect. But, yeah. um, but his right. book is really about undermining national divisions and, mm -hmm. and straightforward narratives about identity. And so this, I think, really is actually um, uh, coincides in very nice ways with um, some of the values in your art. So would you like to talk to us a bit about your adaptation of Finnegan's Wake for the stage? Mm. OK, um, so Finnegan's Wake. So, you know, again, as an Irish person, I said, oh, I better get to grips with this James Joyce guy. And I picked it up over the years. And uh, one year I set myself a, a book list that, 
read the top 100 uh, greatest novels of the 20th century. And of course, Finnegan's Wake is on it. So I couldn't avoid it anymore. So I read it and I couldn't really figure it out. You know, I, I you know, it's bits and pieces, I liked it. So uh, several years later, I was, uh, I was asked to stage um, a, a show for graduating uh, acting students um, and pick whatever piece I wanted. And I, I found in the past, you know, it is problematic to pick a play uh, to your cast because you're never going to get a cast that are perfect for a play. So it always is a compromise. So I felt well, I'll pick a piece of work and adapt it because I can write to whoever the cast is. And I thought, oh, uh, do Finnegan's Wake, obviously. <laughs> um, <laughs> No, but I thought I, I studied it, and I thought, oh, I can pick seven characters out of this, and there, uh, and I can, I can edit it and uh, to focus around characters because there's not a lot of characters. It's not really about characters, uh, but there, if I kind of um, just pick out those pieces, and I thought if I can perform it, if the actors can perform it, all text for them afterwards will be simple because I think for because uh, I teach actors here in LA. Um, and often uh, there's an, in, uh, you know, it's about confidence in terms of performing. There's an, you're intimidated by Shakespeare, you're intimidated by the character of the work. So I said, if they can do this, they will say, well, every other text is going to be easy afterwards. Um, now, so I, 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 I um, took out the pieces that had characters and I presented it in a sort of um, a kind of, devotional or ritualistic form and and I think I think this is important I feel about Joyce is that you know because he was so successful he's now iconic in Ireland again he you know he's on the stamp he's the statues to him if people who succeed artists who succeed at that level become sort of frozen in aspect they're kind of put on and uh, we forget that this is an avant-garde artist. This artist's point was he was pushing the envelope, as it were. And so uh, I think it's less interesting to do in the 21st century a staging of the dead in a naturalistic yeah. uh, 19th century form. Um, I think that you're losing the spirit of Joyce by doing that, by making it a museum piece. And I thought, no, what's, going, what's relevant about this guy is the idea of, of it being a kind of avant-garde, experiential work. Um, so I staged it in terms of there's music I composed for it as original music. Um, I had got a choreographer in for the actors to uh, kind of, there's dance involved, um, there's screens. It's, it's a piece, it's more like a, um, an art piece than a theater piece because there's no sort of beginning, middle and end as there isn't in the book. And there isn't dramatic tension really. Um, but again, it was a shortened piece, it was only an hour long. So I think dramatic tension is a big component for longer pieces. So. That was my logic, that was my approach. And the most important part of it, I think, is that it's for the ear. When you look at Finnegan's Wake and it's on your desk and you open it up and it's just a brick of words, it's very intimidating and off-putting and go, who's got time for that? Like whatever about before, now with all of the options in the world, who's got time for that? And you go, I'm, I can't do it. But when a person stands up in front of you as a character, and recites the language and the language washes over you. It's poetic, it's lyrical, it creates images, it creates, it's quite meditative. And uh, it's closer to an opera than a theater piece. And I think even if, I don't know what that was about, but I quite liked it, you know? I got the sense of night or I got the sense of water or I got the sense of family. And yeah. so yeah. again, it seems quite a, peculiar a perverse attitude to say I'm trying to popularize the most obscure piece of literature in the English language but that absolutely is my goal and I think if people go and see that then they go oh yeah that wasn't too bad I guess I could give something else a go. Yeah.
I can imagine it's very hard to get an impression, a real impression without being there, like without actually being in that immersive space, you know, feeling the kind of lights and sitting in the mm. dark and hearing the voices, you know, from actual bodies. But do you want to show us a clip just to give us a sense? Sure. I can, I, what I can show you is a montage of stills taken from a rehearsal and yeah. uh, some, a recital of one of the characters, the, um, the uh, Anna Livia Plur Bell character. So um, let me find. Very interesting. So, I mean, it sounds like, a, I mean, there's a very young cast, actually, which is really interesting. Mm. And they look like very interesting people. Um, and there's also, it seems like a, a real sense of speech making or that, you know, people are um, holding forth in a way individually in sequence, rather than it being an attempt to create scenes um, that, where there's actual dialogue. Okay, well, so there were there were uh, there were scenes and there were interactions. So that is the Anna Olivia Florabel character, who's kind of the mother figure. It's kind of Ireland. It's kind of the world. And I I I, I kind of cast her in the costume of uh, the woman who used to dance on O'Connell Street, uh, where the Anna Olivia statue once was before it was moved out. Um, and I, I just this kind of uh, Kathleen Houlihan and Mother Ireland character that she was, and she's sort of in the center. And then there's pairs of characters that revolve around her. So there's the washerwomen who are in Finnegan's Wake, and they have a whole conversation. And then we have two versions uh, of James Joyce, uh, Shem the Penman and uh, Sean Postman, and they have an interaction, and that's a sort of self-hating. Uh, <laughs> uh artist having a fight and then we have hc the father figure having an argument with his uh, daughter about his own behavior so there are scenes in it and and so even the way it's choreographed it's sort of like an atom she's kind of in the center and they kind of revolve around her and it's viewed in the round and there's two screens on either end so when an actor's got their back to you you can see them in a close up from the other end of the stage. So it was kind of, that was kind of harking back also to a kind of uh, policy, an old style, kind of again, the ritualistic aspect, not the proscenium art, not everybody sitting face in one way, which is a quite 19th century thing. Again, I think what I got from the book or my interest in the book uh, kind of stems from a lot of the sort of devotional, ritualistic, atavistic aspect of the text. That I think uh, that I think makes it contemporary. So yes, there was her character definitely because, like Molly Bloom, it's a female character gets the last word in the in the book, which is interesting. I think Joyce um, is quite male in his character, Stephen Dallas and Leopold Bloom and all that. But I do think he gives the best bits to the women, both Molly and and and. and and the Florabelle, I think, are the more, more interesting characters in both.
Yeah. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Um, how so I'm going to open it up now to questions from the audience. So please type any questions that you have in the chat and um, Mark would be I um, would be very happy to answer them. I, I kind of want to ask you about um, this very complex, you know, these books are very complex representations of Irishness mm. and how you feel as an Irish person in LA and, you know, sort of Hollywood's understanding of Irishness. I see that uh, Mary Fox asked a, a question about this. Um, what you what you think of like how this portrayal of Irishness reflects or doesn't reflect who how you think of yourself? Well, you know, I, I think this is the whole challenge about uh, identity because it is the combination of who you think you are and who other people tell you are, and both are valid, and and that's actually I think a common um contemporary blind spot is that this whole sense that everybody should have an internal innate pre-existing self-identity and uh, that is not the case you, your identity is a combination of how you feel how you you know you see yourself and what is reflected back to you in the world so irishness i think irishness absolutely is both our understanding of ourselves and our interpretation of what other people say. So in many ways, people say a lot of, you know, a lot of contemporary Irish nationalism was formed in America um, in terms of, you know, you're an Irish person, but you're, you're a royal subject uh, when you're living in Ireland. But when you go to the US and you meet a guy from Sligo and you are from Kerry, you normally wouldn't necessarily see an identification. But in the context of being abroad, you suddenly go, oh, I'm Catholic, you're Catholic, I speak Gaelic, I speak, oh, I eat bacon. And, you know, and certainly there's commonalities that you wouldn't see when you're at home. So I think it's that whole question about betrayal is so complicated. Um, like I explain to people in America, they go, oh, St. Patrick's Day must be massive in Ireland. And I go, you know, it wasn't always like that. When I was growing up, it was a little parade and there's a tractor pulling some girls on the back down at some Irish dancing in the rainy. Yeah. But then we used, we'd get American visitors who'd arrive up and go, well, this is the, you know, this is the mothership. Where's your festival must be much bigger than the one in Chicago. And it wasn't. So suddenly we had to kind of quick scramble around and produce a weekend long festival. But that's total reflective, uh, reflexive sort of uh, project. And I think we can do, we can look at that over and over and over again in Irish history about our sense of ourselves and adapting and developing our sense of ourselves through what other people think. And uh, I mean, we mentioned Flannery Brown and James Joyce, both people who are, um, you know, they were around in a period that was kind of obsessed with nationalism and patriotism, and they were in, entrenched in it and rejected some of it, and, but embraced a lot of it, you know. Mm. So did I answer the question? Hollywood. I mean, I, I mean, the Hollywood thing is interesting because, again, I mean, there was a, I remember seeing an interview with Colin Farrell going for an audition and the casting director said your Irish accent is not going to work and he was playing an Irish character and the point being it's irrelevant if it is an actual Irish accent what's important is what do the audience consider is an Irish accent and again that's an extendable notion in many many areas of identity is it's the um, authenticity is really irrelevant if you're trying to reach a lot of people who have a different perception of mm. of what that is so hollywood i i'm not <laughs> i i also i always find what you know can you assess a film's quality whether it's authentically uh, observes you know the people in the community it appear in the film i gone well it's it's not for them it's a mass medium it's for the most people possible so if you are really i mean i think that's the challenge to try and tell a really 
authentically um, original, insightful story that has popular appeal. And um, it's, it's tricky. And I, I don't think it's a requirement. I don't think it's a requirement of popular art forms to be representative. And I think people get, get very upset about that when they go, oh, that's not how it really happened. I go, well, we all know it's movies, right? <laughs> Can you tell us about some of the projects you've been involved in? Um, yeah, well, I mean, I've, I've, I've written and directed my own feature film, um, and that was a very painful experience. Uh, and I've kind of, uh, it kind of pushed me away from movies for a long time, just because it was, the nature of how films have to be produced uh, makes it difficult for the quote unquote author. Um, but what I'm currently developing now, and again, I think TV in some ways with streaming is kind of, is the new movie, you know, um, I'm working on a, again, it's back to my sense of my Irishness and uh, indeed my Carlinness even is I'm developing a story about an Irish born silent uh, movie director by the name of William Desmond Taylor. And uh, William Desmond Taylor was born in, the same street as me in Ireland. And I only discovered this when I came to LA, but he was, uh, he was murdered in his apartment in 1922, um, pretty much the same time as, um, as Ulysses comes out on February 2nd. And uh, at the time he was the head of production Paramount Studios. He had set up the, um, in the, the, the movie directors guild. Um, and he had worked with the stars of the era, Mary Pickford, et cetera. He'd done about 90 movies at that point. He'd done the first screen adaptations of uh, old Mark Twain's Huckleberry Finn and of Green Gables also. So he, he did a lot of the, he's quite a, he's a very significant film director. And so he, this story of this, and I, again, I think this is quite interesting often that I fe felt I came over to LA in you know 1999 I thought oh my god I'm so adventurous I'm the first person ever to do this you know and every time you kind of read anything you go oh, someone did it 50 years ago someone did it 100 years ago someone did it 200 years ago and you start to see oh we have notions of globalization and kind of migration and all that as being new and it certainly isn't so the Taylor story for me is very interesting about the 1920s. I think it's extraordinarily um, exciting time in terms of art, literature, you know, um, social developments, where women get the vote, uh, you know, we have modernism kind of comes to its peak, movies and mass uh, media, radio and TV and all that. So I found it a really fascinating era. And there was this Irish guy at the center of it in Hollywood, um, and then he gets killed. So there's a murder mystery attached to it as well. So it has, uh, has all the elements that kind of fascinate me. And um, I think, uh, you know, it, it's a pretty fascinating story. So that's, that's my, uh, sort of my current project that I'm co-writing with uh, a writer who had a series called Moon Boy over in the UK oh, yeah. uh, a Great. few years ago. Yeah. yeah, so that was written by the, by the, the star Chris O'Dowd and my co-writer, Nick Murphy. And so we're writing this together. He's from Kilkenny, so we kind of are not far from each other back in Ireland. And he's, I'm in Hollywood and he's over in, in Studio City, so we're not far from each other here either. And will this be a film aimed at a popular audience? So the plan is to make this a TV series. Oh. Um, and I mean, like I, I, have, I, have, I have pursued the story in a couple of outlets already. I mean, I set up a silent film festival in Ireland and ran it for three years. That was sort of celebrating the Irish contribution to early cinema, which is not really discussed. Um, it's not discussed because most Irish artists and contributors have to be in Ireland unless they're, um, you know, uh, James Joyce for people to acknowledge them. So a lot of the people in early Hollywood, they're forgotten about generally, but certainly the Irish contributors are totally forgotten because Hollywood's not really interested because it looks forward. And Ireland isn't really interested because it's, oh, it's happening in America. 
So these, these characters kind of fell between two stools. Um, but I felt it was, again, a really interesting diaspora story um, and our contribution to the wider uh, world in a way that people didn't know. So I ran this festival um, to kind of promote these things. So I've done that and I've also done an, a radio show on that, on, on the William Disney Taylor story. So talked to the BBC and stuff about it and written in the Irish Times. And so I've, I've approached it a few times, but I do think um, there is such a demand for, um, uh, for content, for streaming, that it absolutely is a world. The 1920s in Hollywood, I mean, I think it's an extraordinarily exciting time and place. I mean, it's very interesting to think about the range of your work. I'm just continually struck by it, you know, like your film Black Magic is set in LA and Thailand. Mm. And so how did you, what, what was the story behind that film or the kind of genesis of the film? Um, so the genesis of that film is I was uh, at that time teaching in a film school in, um, in Los Angeles and you know, it was a, a lot of the programs were short programs for people who weren't not, who weren't going to be full-time students. They had an interest in making a film and they kind of went, I just want to know the basics, you know. So often it was a use for, uh, for people to arrive in LA to, um, as a kind of context in which then develop their films. And uh, with this project, it was uh, to, um, uh, two aspiring filmmakers from uh, Indonesia, uh, one kind of Chinese, there's a Chinese kind of diaspora in Indonesia and another native Indonesian. And they wanted to make a film, but they didn't have a script and they didn't. Um, and so they, they take my course and they liked the cut of my jib and they asked me to uh, write the script. And I said, sure, I'll write a script for you if, uh, as a commission. And then they said, oh, well, you go and direct it. And I was like, okay. Um, I'll direct it. So then we went off and we we shot in we shot in Thailand and we shot around Los Angeles and it got a theatrical release in five different um, territories and got worldwide release in DVD and all the rest of it. But as I said, the experience is bad for me because towards the end of after I wrote and directed every shot um, and it was edited. Basically, they came in and said, "Oh, we'll take it from here." and I, you know, wasn't in the union. I wasn't, um, I didn't have any kind of legal uh, redress. So they kind of took it. And I don't know if the film is entirely successful, but unlike other artistic failures where you can assess, you learn from it because uh, the failures weren't all of my making. It's a bit hard for me to kind of take a lot from it. I mean, certain things I've learned from it, um, but generally I kind of went, uh, that was a not very pleasant experience having one's work taken away from one, you know, so. Um, but still, it was, uh, it was uh, a real luxury for someone to go, here's all the toys, make a 35 mil feature and you're going on location yeah. to Bangkok to do it, you know. Yeah. Um, okay, so we have a question here. When you were influenced by the silent movie, oh yeah, were you influenced by the artist? <laughs> and do you find at this point in your career, you're circling homeward to source ideas? So, you know, there's a real contrast between these, you know, the Taylor project and um, this, the story, it seems, of um, Black Magic. Yeah, well, um, okay, so in terms of uh, this, uh, the artist, um, I think, you know, it's a fascinating, the artist won, won the best uh, picture, and it was a silent movie, it's kind of extraordinary, black and white silent movie, it's pretty, it's certainly a, um, a real tour de force for that for that production, uh, but my interest in silent film was always, you know, the, 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 it's often spoken about in film circles that you know, in many ways, classical cinema died when the talkies were introduced because suddenly you didn't have to convey all of your ideas visually or musically, non-textually. I mean, I know there are interstitials and all that, but this was the notion that as an art form, you had to figure out a way of dramatizing a situation or telling a story through pictures. And once you can have people come in and talk, that uh, undermine that. So it is often spoken about in, you know, screenwriting, in filmmaking school, you're going, how does your film work 
in pictures? And if it doesn't work in pictures, is it a radio play? Is it a stage play? Um, so you have to think in pictures and some stories aren't suitable for that. They're not, they may, you may put them on screen, but I mean, we often see that when we see our favorite stage plays adapted that you kind of go, mm, yeah, the play was better because the, the writer wrote it for that context. So what I find inspiring about silent cinema is the idea of the, of the creator sitting down and going, how is this working in terms of observing action? Um, uh, how, are, how is this working in terms of a purely visual medium, which kind of transcends words in many ways? Um, so that's, uh, I find it very, um, silent film very uh, exciting in that regard. In terms of circling back to my homeland, I don't think I've ever left. I mean, I, I, came, I came to America first in 1999. I stayed here for five years and then I went to India for 10 years and then I'm back again. But I mean, in all of that time, I have, as I said, I've been looking through this filter of, of Irishness in that context. So I was very fascinated about the Irish relationship with India when I was there. And I set up a film festival to that end when I was in India. And, you know, just as I talk about William Desmond Taylor's impact in Hollywood, we could talk about Irish uh, impacts and interactions with India, whether it's WB8 and Tagore, you know, or the influence of the Irish independence movement upon the Indian independence movement and so forth and so on. So um, I'm, I, I, I have never left it. Again, you know, that's James Joyce. He's sitting in Trieste or, or, or in Paris and he's writing about Middle Abbey Street, you know. <laughs> yes, uh, and also Egypt, yeah. And um, mm. well, I feel, Mark, I mean, we're just beginning to get into it now, but our time's up. Um, maybe we'll just take this one last question uh, that Tom Walsh has asked. Um, okay, these satirical aspects of these writers, they pulled no punches in making criticisms of their culture. Each is received differently by the establishment in Ireland. I mean, I guess it's about like an Irish animus. What do you make of that? Uh, you mean in terms of the uh, artists? artists role in it? Or are you talking about how the establishment looked upon the writers uh, before they were beatified? When you I, say animus? I'd say, I mean, I think, the, you know, the satirical aspect of their writing, I think it's, yeah, um, yeah, the, you know, yeah. The, the, the struggle, you know, the, the refusal to accept things as they are. Yeah, well, I think there is a big part of Irish culture um, historically has been to do, is coming from a place of either political or economic uh, disempowerment. And so even, you know, even when people were educated, like I think it's very interesting with someone like e either Fan Ryan or James Joyce, you know, what were the opportunities available uh, to them I mean, you're a, you're a kid come out of school in Ireland now, you get an engineering degree, you're working for Google, you may have walked to the end of the street and you're working for the most powerful entity on earth. You know, if you, in Ireland over the centuries, if you wanted access to power, you had to do what George Bernard Shaw or Wilde did and you went to London. Now it's fortunate, it's quite near, but it's still, you're not in Ireland. And so I think whether it was um, sort of economic pressure that you just go, I can't, I can't make, I'm, I, I'm resentful that I, I'm very educated and I can't make a living, or you feel, uh, you, you feel undermined by the social pressures, uh, actually sexuality and freedom and all of those things. I think it made a lot of people sit in their garret, you know, scratching out on a pad or smashing on a typewriter um, a lot of uh, angst and bitterness, and that can be made palatable. So you're not just a complainer when it's done satirically or ironically. Mm -hmm. So 
you know, uh, you know, um, they they say you know Flan Brian and Olin lost his job because people got tired of his satire for ministers while he was a civil servant, and it was a kind of open secret that he was there, and they went enough is enough. Now it could be in his drinking, but also his drinking could have been connected with that sense of why hasn't people haven't people acknowledged the fact that I'm a genius writer also. Um, so he stayed in Ireland. If we look at our other great writers, Beckett, uh, you know, uh, Wild Show, they got out. And so they didn't, uh, they weren't as the repression or their sense of their own repression wasn't there. So I think it's kind of interesting, you know, a lot of these writers, yeah, absolutely would have attacked the establishment and uh, thrown a few punches. But then now, as I said, they are board fortune material, you know, um, come and do the James Joyce tour, um, which I think, I guess it's sort of inevitable if your main export is writers and artists, then, yeah. you know, that's who you yeah. uplift and you represent as your culture. You know? Yes, and this fodder for tourism, it's pretty good fodder, I could say. Yeah, yeah it could, there could be worse. I mean, obviously, the scenario I'm interested in, so I like the sound of it, but, I, you know, um, yeah, I think I think what's interesting, sorry, just on that note about is it does make it hard for visitors to engage in this when you're as a visitor to Ireland and you go, oh, it's this great literary kind of culture and tradition. How do you experience that when you're there for a weekend? You know, I guess maybe people used to go to the Abbey and go to and watch a play, but it's a bit other than that, it's kind of hard. It's a quite a funny um you know, amorphous thing to interact with, you know? I mean, it's interesting that, you know, there's, there are a lot of new institutions catering to um, literary and cultural tourists, like Molly, mm. a museum of mm. literature in Ireland, or, you know, mm. the new James Joyce Center. There, you know, there, mm. they, I think that um, there are genuine efforts to connect people mm. actually with the substance of literature and, and art in Ireland. But, um, we're going to have to wrap it up here. Um, thank you again for um, talking with us. I feel like we're really only getting going. But um, and thanks to the audience for spending this time with us on Patrick's Day, 2021, in the middle of the pandemic. Um, well, good night to everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me.